Uh, well, now, uh, as uh, this morning, take uh, some inputs from the audience. We we'll should have uh, the QR code up here again uh, so that you can uh, connect to the website uh, where we vote on how to continue. You could also otherwise type uh, this email address that you see. While we keep this slide up for a moment, let me say how this continues. I'm uh, uh, liberally borrowing from your three Ps, populism, polarization, and post-truth. Uh, we'll get uh, one choice of each of them. Now let's move uh, two slides forward from here. We'll start either by talking about how to deal uh, with <laughs> populist parties in the political arena, or how to deal with the polarization in society that may underlie the rise of population, or how to deal with post-truth in the media that might fuel the rise of populism. Let's give you some time uh, to make your decision and click your answer. And we'll look at the results. Can we bet on which one will win? Yes, why don't we do that? What's your view? I think three will win. <laughs> Professor Kovic. Two will win. <laughs> and then I bet on one. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> That's a populist choice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was, that was a close one. So um, it's even life changing. So someone still wants to tip the scale. All right, good. We'll start with post truth in the media, and of course, we'll also briefly certainly touch I on that with them. the <laughs> other points. Um, Dr. Naim, uh, one of your recent columns in uh, the El Pais newspaper uh, was titled uh, The War on Truth, and uh, it, uh, it brings up um, this uh, you know, surprising uh, observation that also with the, with the rise of new forms of communication, with the internet, with YouTube, uh, suddenly uh, we don't see a, uh, a, a change in information where you know, everyone just very easily gets access to uh, uh, sound information, but also a lot of disinformation, or what you uh, have said uh, is uh, sort of a concerted effort to uh, spread uh, lies. Uh, is this a feature, uh, especially as it results from new modes of communication, that is just the new normal that will stay with us also in the future? No, I think it's unsustainable. Uh, I think uh, it's very hard. Facebook will not get away with continuing to doing what they're doing uh, without some intervention. Societies will rebel against that. Uh, and uh, we will find ways of uh, bringing back truth uh, to the public discourse. We will need Sherpas, meaning institutions, technologies, individuals that help, that guide us and help us identify uh, what's truth and what's not. Um, this is, is part of the paradoxes of our times. When the internet came, we all said that the internet was a tool of liberation and that uh, dictatorship will going to have a hard time dealing with that. And that is partly true, but it is also true that uh, those dictatorships have learned to use it. And now, uh, in many places, the internet is a source of oppression and repression. Um, there is also the paradox that we now live in a time in which we can know anything. With a few clicks uh, in your computer, you can get access to anything. But the paradox is that at the same time that we have access to all the information, we are very um, confused and we are full of uh, disinformation. And it's very interesting how at an age in which all the surveys show the trust in each other, in institutions, in politicians, in the church, in the media, is dropping. We trust uh, a message that comes uh, in our mailbox that aligns to our sympathies, prejudices, and tribes. So we are more than willing to take an anonymous message that comes to our internet inbox and, and send it to our family, friends, and allies uh, without checking if that's true or if it's... We're very trust, trust uh, we, we trust the internet when the internet brings us information or statements that are aligned to our preju prejudices and interests and are willing to take that at face value. 
that also will change. Professor Kovic, do you yes, see that I, also I, I, as a, as a part of driving this uh, yeah. populism? I see it a little bit uh, different than Moshe because, in my opinion, truth is nothing abstract or absolute. But if we follow, for example, Pierre Bourdieu or Karl Mannheim, then we can see that every truth is driven by standpoints, by the positions in which we live that determine our reality, our per perspectives, and uh, that are functions of our truths. That means uh, truth is nothing abs abstract or absolute, but it's a part of uh, being in the world. It's, it's a part of um, seeing the world through a certain hole in the mall. That means um, uh, we cannot say that um, the, the invention of radio is, for example, responsible for Goebbels as a propaganda minister. Uh, but this is only a medium, and the medium is not the, the causation, the reason for, for social phenomenon, but only a transportation, a transportation medium. And in my opinion, is uh, the post-fact, the post-truth in our society, um, a function of the social divide, which always means a social division of reality and perspectives. I strongly disagree with you. <laughs> I mean, let me, let me connect here. Uh, if you were to change the word truth for fact, would you, also, would you say there are no facts? Or, or, or is it the case, I'm, I'm asking a professor, <laughs> or would you say that, that it is also part of this argument that every fact now has an alternative fact to contradict it? Um, no, I, I doubt. That's, that's a mean question because uh, it, uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, but, but let us see to Trump, and uh, he tries to make um, a politics that is based on, uh, on post truth. And what I guess what he is doing, he changes the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. That means um, he, he won't uh, maintain that, that uh, his facts are facts, but he tells the established parties that he gives a fuck on it, <coughs> that his fact, his truth is emotional. And so he tries uh, to say, uh, oh, you, you, you with your facts, that's not my game. I have a different game. So that we, means he, um, he changes the rules of the game in a special social field, in the field of politics. And says uh, that he now makes the rules and not the other side. Good. So I think you, you, you put forward an interesting distinction, as I understand, between essentially the factual fact and the emotional alternative fact that is not really meant to be factual, but, but is given more as, a, I guess, a characterization of how people's, you know, uh, maybe worldview is on, on, on how they uh, perceive things. Uh, on that, I would like to relate uh, to something that you said, uh, Professor Guiso. You said that uh, when these Italian uh, populist parties made these promises on no immigration, economic boom, that the politicians already knew that they were lying to the people when they made those promises. Do you think that also the voters realize that the politicians will not really follow up on that? Apparently not. Uh, I'm not even sure that uh, some, of, I mean, I'm pretty sure actually that these politicians were uh, realizing. But you can twist uh, words uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, what a politician is uh, good at is always uh, uh, has a line of defense uh, to argue that the statement was uh, plausible, was defendable, was not contradictory. Like, you know, when uh, uh, Di Maio was promising uh, we have abolished poverty, there was a seed of truth there, in the sense that he wrote a law that was an anti, let's say, he could claim that was an anti-poverty law, but clearly was uh, stretching the uh, content of uh, truth in the statement to the point that uh, you know the statement was largely uh, a false uh, uh, promise. So the question is why uh, you know 
today we can stretch words uh, so much and why people are uh, sort of uh, willing to digest and uh, tolerate uh, 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 this type of uh, uh, stretching. You know, uh, in other times, probably, there could have been a rebellion uh, on the side of the interviewer, uh, on the side of the voters, uh, uh, for uh, people that were uh, uh, sort of gaming uh, with, uh, with the words. Today, you don't see that. So I think this is, a, I find this a fascinating uh, uh, question, why, uh, you know, my impression is that it's not people that are not able to discount some of these features. It's so patently false that uh, uh, poverty was abolished that one would expect that uh, anyone, uh, even with an elementary degree, is able to state that statement is false. But why we are willing uh, to accept, uh, uh, you know, such false uh, uh, statements. So it means that you know, there must be an ability of some of these politicians to link uh, to uh, people's uh, expectations or feelings, whatever, that they can afford it. And the same is true with Trump. I mean, uh, many of the things that he says are uh, patently false, but apparently <laughs> they are uh, uh, able to uh, bring in a consensus. So the puzzling uh, thing is why false statements are successful. And on this, I honestly, I have no answer. So, I think uh, you know you're pointing in the direction of uh, these uh, false statements in politics, even though sometimes they could potentially or are probably identified by some of the voters as being wrong. They clearly cater to some demand in society for these uh, statements or uh, or policies. That I think also brings us to you know our runner-up topic here polarization in uh, society, and I would uh, like to go back to our uh, col uh, colleague from sociology, Professor Kopech. You uh, laid out uh, a, a list of concrete uh, things that one could do uh, in order to uh, you know, deal with populism. If you uh, now just think of uh, the single most important issue in, uh, or, or measure to take in your view, to, uh, to overcome polarization in society, what would you say would that be? Um, we have to um, get capitalism re-embedded again. That means uh, the system in, in, in the industrial society, all the different spheres of society were in balance. We had a political system, economic system, welfare system, um, educational system and so on. And nowadays, in the global modern era, uh, capital capitalism has escaped, escaped the, uh, the bondages of social institution and cannot be controlled anymore. So um, if we have, if we try to, to reduce social inequality and to rebuild social polarization, then we have to re-embed the capitalism into a set of global institutional, global political and welfare and cultural in institutions so that the world society comes uh, on a new emergent um, state of order, if you understand what I mean. That means we have um, the, the economic system is the fastest that has get abandoned from control, and now we have to reset the other systems on a global, to reorganize other systems on a global order in order to control the capitalism again. This uh, strikes me as a very interesting uh, thought uh, that you bring up uh, a transnational welfare system, mm. given that um, many populist movements seem to be strongly nationalist. Wouldn't the transnational welfare system also mean, let's say, in the European context, that the Germans would have to pay a lot of money to poor people in Bulgaria, much more so than they do now? Yes, but uh, the, the, the persons who um, are proponents of uh, what I'm describing now as the global new global order are not the same as the populist. That are different mm. uh, people because the populists try um, to do the opposite. They want to close their own society, they want to um, 
rebuild the borders and they want to have it like the industrial society in a national container. But this is not possible anymore, so the populists want the opposite from the global world system. Um, so if I can uh, jump in on this, uh, on this discussion, I, I think that the issue of the um, reforming, rethinking, uh, uh, revisiting the design of the welfare system is a super important one. Uh, now clearly, you know, uh, as you were uh, easily guessing, that if you say today, let's uh, merge uh, the welfare systems of uh, uh, Italy and Germany, uh, you don't get much support for it. A lot in Italy, probably, but <laughs> not much in Germany. You know? uh, nobody's willing to sort of uh, transfer money to another, uh, uh, to another country. But let's uh, um, uh, stay within the borders of a single country and think, uh, uh, you know, if there is room for using the, the design of the welfare system in order to answer some of the uh, current challenges? And my answer, I, I think, yes, definitely. Um, and the reason is the following, that um, our welfare system was mostly uh, thought, a big thing, it was doing two things. One is to, you know, to provide uh, uh, money for uh, retirement, and, and the other was uh, smoothing uh, uh, the business cycle, so unemployment uh, insurance, basically, which works perfectly if uh, the main issue is the up and down of uh, the business cycle, you have uh, an expansion that is followed by a, uh, uh, a recession, there is unemployment, and you need to take care of the people between uh, uh, the drops and the ups uh, in, the, in the business cycle. The impression is that today things are, uh, the nature of the shock is not predominantly macro, but it's mostly uh, micro enduring uh, and often not visible at the macro level. You know, for instance, in Germany is a country that went through the financial crisis pretty well, has been growing like crazy, unemployment rate is relatively low. So if you look at the macro picture, you would say, why these people are uh, voting uh, for alliance for, uh, uh, for Germany? Uh, you need to go micro in order to understand uh, uh, the stuff. And probably, you know, the nature of the shocks that are uh, bringing the anxiety that you are uh, uh, mentioning is, more, uh, is much more uh, micro, is much more uh, uh, local. Uh, and they have, uh, you know, we, we know more uh, about the nature of the shocks that often they are uh, destroying the human capital of the individuals. Uh, you know, the uh, pace of technological innovation does essentially this. So the question is whether we can uh, rethink a little bit the design of the welfare system in order to make it better able to tackle uh, these uh, uh, type of uh, shocks. And my impression, uh, impression is yes, like for instance, you know, uh, thinking of uh, a better integration between uh, uh, the welfare system and uh, uh, the, uh, the schooling system in order to retrain workers when uh, they lose part of their human capital. Um, readapting the schooling system in, in order to provide, let's say, a portfolio of skills that, you know, since you don't know where the shock is coming from, uh, you are a little bit uh, more diversified in, in terms of human capital and things of the sort. So I think there is a lot of room for doing that. And with reforming the welfare state, of course, we're circling back now to uh, the political parties that uh, could potentially institute changes. Uh, one issue that I think we haven't touched on yet is uh, also in the, in the panel in this morning is the question if we see these new uh, fringe parties coming up, which in many countries are minority parties like the Sweden Democrats, the Alternative for Deutschland or Vox in Spain, then at some point the question comes up whether established parties should consider entering into a governing coalitions with uh, these uh, new potential partners. Uh, Dr. Naim, do you have a view on whether that is a good way of integrating uh, these uh, populist views and perhaps to some extent uh, uh, moderating these views? It's case by case. It's very hard to, 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 to generalize uh, what's happening with politics in Spain. It's quite different with uh, the reason why in Israel they cannot get a government together or because uh, the, the United Kingdom cannot uh, find a, a way to resolve uh, Brexit so far. So it is, it is um, very specific to the country. 
but what is true is about political parties is that very often recently, what you have seen, what we have seen, is that political parties, new political parties, are just machines, to uh, are electoral machines, uh, to bring uh, to power a specific individual that owns, is the kind, quote unquote, the owner of the party, and the party is at his service or her service, and, and that's the purpose. These are not the political parties that I think are needed. I think we, you need institutions that are not dependent on a charismatic leader and, and his ambitions or her ambitions. Uh, you need a political party with a vision of the future, with an ideology, with principles and concepts uh, uh, and all that. And, uh, and, and, and unless we have that, we're going to have a, a very hard time uh, debating these issues in a variety of ways, including what's truth and what's not. Good. With that, I would like to open to questions uh, on the floor. I will start uh, right here in front uh, with uh, my colleague Ernst Fehr. So I, have a, I have a question for Moises. Uh, you said we, we won't let Facebook get away with it. Uh, now, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more what we would have to do in con more concrete terms to, to establish uh, a, a political communication that is more uh, fact-driven and less post-truth-driven? In uh, a few weeks ago, uh, um, Mark Zuckerberg went to Congress, to the U.S. Congress, and uh, a congresswoman called Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez uh, asked him uh, if uh, uh, there was something deliberately, was a deliberate lie, and they knew that it was a lie, will they still allow that information to float and to be... Uh, transmitted through Facebook, and he couldn't answer that. He didn't give an answer to that. Mm. Uh, they keep saying that they are like utilities, that they cannot, be, uh, they cannot be editors, that they cannot be in charge of deciding what information and what content they uh, allow to circulate in their networks. But that's not true. Uh, they are giant advertising agencies and uh, they will be regulated. I have no doubt that they will be regulated. That is a big fight that is looming, uh, but it will happen. That doesn't mean that the problem will be solved. As we, as we know, reg regulation takes you so far and, 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 and generates its own uh, uh, problems. Uh, but all I know is that the current situation is unsustainable. Mm. I, I, I have here... For example, um, Donald Trump put this in his, in his Twitter account. These animals in the press, they are animals, actually. Some of the worst human beings you'll ever meet. Fake news, fake news. They are total, just terrible, dishonest people. This is the President of the United States in his Twitter feed. This is the person that has uh, uh, have, has, we counted, or the Washington Post has a unit that counts the lies, that does fact-checking on the president. This is a president that has lied 12,000 times <laughs> since. And, and, and uh, this is, about lies or not, there is a very intelligent, erudite, philosophical even, way of discussing what's truth and what's not, and everything is relative. But there are some things that are very concrete. We are in Zurich, and this is the afternoon, and that's not a relative uh, statement. In, in, in politics, there are statements like that, that are not relative, that you can verify, that you can fact check, that you cannot allow uh, <laughs> things that are not true uh, to circulate. We are in Zurich, and it's the afternoon. That I think we all agree on, and we're also agreeing on taking another question over there. In this debate about truth, there are maybe two positions. One position says there is one truth, and then some people know it and other people don't know it. I would rather say there is no singular truth. There are only perceptions of truth. So if we debate on truth, is it really about the content of truth, or is it more a debate on who are currently the dominant uh, 
definer of, 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 or, of, of perceptions. Or we had this kind of discussion already in the 50s with McCarthyism. We had this is also with the beginning of the Iraq war. It is not a new phenomenon. So what makes it different now that we have an intuition that there is something which is true and something which is not true? What, what is really the new phenomenon now? Do you want to answer very briefly? Listen, there is a continuum. There is a f f assertion that says we are in Zurich and it's the afternoon. And that I think you will have no problem accepting that we don't need to debate that, right? You, you accept that. There is no, we don't go, we don't need to go deep with the philosophers to agree with that. And then in the continuum, there are f f more subjective assertions that are open to debate. And that's fine. But not all of, not everything is in this, con in this part of the continuum that is subject to debate. We have very, when the, the guy in Italy says we have uh, uh, ended poverty, that's not true. That is not true, and that is a verifiable untruth. And then there are more subjective ways of interpreting. All I'm saying is that making this too much of an intellectual debate obscures the fact that lies are put at the, at the service of power. Every time that people lie uh, in politics, behind that is, is a way of uh, furthering their power or defending their position. And that is what we need to unmask. Good. There we have another question. Thank you very much for um, the very interesting discussions. I wondered um, about one thing in particular, in, and that is in what way do you think the populists are actually capitalizing on the prestige of traditional left topics? Um, actually, it's a form of capitalizing on the idealism of uh, traditional left-wing topics. Um, because I think as soon as politicians kind of go into the public arena, they often start to believe their own narrative very strongly. And um, one thing which is very salient in the whole discussion is we want to further the, the lot of the ordinary man. And that is actually a traditional, I mean, there is a lot of virtue in that, in, in some sense. So I wondered, to what extent do you think that is really at the heart somewhere of this whole upsurge of populist politics. And the second point I would like to make is, so I've heard from Cornelia Kopecz really this um, idea of being in the world and there's a social division of perception. Um, and I think that's true. But I also think what, what's also happening is that there's a vulgarization of that, um, a vulgarization of that very sophisticated way of thinking and that produce, is part of the confusion that's happening. Is is exactly this um, vulgarization of the sophisticated philosophical approach of how to look at uh, politics and social reality. So maybe it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Professor Kopic, uh, let me take that right to you. Yes. Do you see that trends were from uh, sort of you know l left ideas now being funneled into the, the populism on the right? Um, not exactly the ideas, but the style. That means uh, we have a, we, we can see a parallel between the counter movement of the uh, 68 in the last year of the 20th century. There was a kind of a counter movement uh, that was grassroots, that was very ambitious and anti establishment and emotional and authentic and so on. And what we are observing now is the integration of this original, um, very critical counter movement into an establishment because their values and norms and world views are incorporated in the mainstream now. And this are we. That means the mainstream is, uh, is built of former countercultural habitus and values that are not countercultural anymore. But some of them, people, still believe they are. 
they are critical, they are anti-establishment, they are very leftist, and so on. And that's not true. But what has happened now, we, we uh, observe a, a next generation of counter-movement that goes anti-established now, and that means automatically that it is anti-leftist because the establishment has become leftist. And so the right-wing populism is, has very much similarities with the former 68 movements and the uh, um, Friedensbewegung, um, um, how, uh, how did you call it? AKW Bewegung, etc. And has similar styles and similar critics in anti-establishment. Mm -hmm. Good. With that, uh, I think we have drawn now a wide arc from uh, post-truth to polarization to populism. Um, uh, I would like to thank uh, our panelists for uh, the engaging uh, discussion and their uh, uh, inspiring insights, uh, Professor Guizo, Professor Kopech, and Dr. Naim. Um, we will uh, continue at 3.30, but before that, uh, I'd like uh, to give our panelists uh, a large round of applause. Thank you.